All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arul, and I have my colleague Ayush with me. Uh, we both work at Cockroach Labs. Uh, we're the builders of the database called CockroachDB. And uh, today we're going to talk about our paper on enabling the next generation of multi-region applications with CockroachDB. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, presented at Sigma 2022. This is accepted at Sigma 2022. And, and yeah, we're just gonna, just gonna talk about this. Right, so first up, um, let's do a quick background on CockroachDB. CockroachDB is a distributed SQL database. Um, so essentially it has a SQL API that it exposes to clients. Um, this is Postgres compatible. It speaks the Postgres wire protocol. So, so ORMs and whatnot that, that speak the wire protocol can connect to CockroachDB as if they were talking to a Postgres instance. Um, but underneath the hood, everything like um, SQL concepts like tables, indexes, and what have you map down into a distributed transactional KV layer. This KV layer is chunked up into partitions. Uh, we call these things ranges. And every range is responsible for uh, doing its own replication. And then it's distributed across the cluster. Raft is the consensus algorithm that we use. Uh, and a couple other things that are worth mentioning is that Cockroach offers serializable isolation and is an MVCC system. We're not going to go into too much more detail about, about Cockroach itself, though I'm happy to answer, um, answer any questions that you may have about the system after when we do the, do the Q&A session. Um, but instead, we're going to focus on the, uh, the multi-region capabilities of Cockroach. And, and that's what the paper was really about. <clears throat> OK, so first up, why run a multi-region database, right? And, and to answer this question, we really need to look at who is running these things in production today. Um, so the largest um, logical si single databases that are distributed across the globe are run by uh, multinational companies that have global user bases. And their users have, have a certain uh, expectation, certain sort of demands that they place on their uh, on their database. For one, they expect low latency experiences. So wherever the users are, whether they be in Europe, whether they be in Asia, they want fast read and write access. Their users also expect always on availability. So things like natural disasters, hardware failures, or data center outages shouldn't really impact, um, shouldn't really impact the service that this uh, company is offering. Lastly, their users also want uh, want compliance with uh, data sovereignty regulations. Uh, and one example would be GDPR, where European users don't want their data leaving the EU. Cool. Running a multi-region database, though, is not easy. It's not easy because um, of, uh, from, from like an operational standpoint, and it's also not easy from an application developer standpoint. Operators sort of have a hard time understanding uh, how, how the placement of, the, of data and uh, query patterns and access patterns to that data will impact things like performance and availability. So missteps in configuring this can, uh, can lead to things like high latency, or in certain cases, it can mean that certain sorts of failures will lead to unavailability of the database itself. Application developers have a hard time um, with multi-region um, deployments as well. Uh, one, one big thing that we find is that um, data locality awareness uh, sometimes makes its way into, into the application stack. Um, and uh, this, could be, this could be via partitioning keys or um, the application needing to be aware where a piece of data lives in, in some other sort of way. And, uh, and the other thing that application developers have to worry about is, uh, is using limited forms of transactions or weaker consistency levels. And all of this is um, all in the name of, of low latency access, right? Cool. So all of this was, um, was extremely high level. And to sort of motivate a bit of the discussion going forward, let's go through, uh, let's go through an example. Um, so for this, we're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna be talking about say an online store or what have you. And um, this online store initially is running in US East. 
um, and they have uh, they have two tables that we're going to focus on. They have uh, they have a users table um, where they keep data of all their users. They have this promo codes table, which uh, which keeps track of discount codes. Um, and you know uh, their users are based in on the east coast, so they get fast access when they uh, when, when they when they interact with uh, with these tables. This business is doing well. They decide to expand. Um, they decide to have European users. They try to expand on the on the west coast. And let's see how using some of the traditional systems or techniques that are out there, how they would solve this problem. One thing that this company might realize very quickly is that their users are based in these different geographic regions, and it makes sense for us to keep their data close to them. So, you know, if a user is based in US West, we can keep it and keep their data in US West if they're based in US East, so on and so forth. But what that means is they lose something here. And what they lose is the uniqueness constraint that they had on, uh, on emails uh, like they did before. Um, and wh what that in turn means is that if, if the application wants to access data about joe at excite.com, it needs to know which Joe it's talking about. So, so US West sort of bleeds into the application stack, which, um, which isn't great. So their code needs to change a bit. The other thing they might realize is that is the promo codes table that they have, it has no natural data affinity like, like users do, right? So this might mean something like, um, like a European user accessing a promo code has to pay the network round trip cost from Europe to US West, where, where in this case, uh, this, this table lives. And, and basically all of this ties back to some of the goals that we had with this work. At a high level, we wanna preserve general serializable SQL. And as much as possible, we wanna make sure that existing applications just work. Um, so we wanna avoid pushing region awareness into the application stack. So as a company scales, as new regions are added, as, as the customer, ba customer base grows or what have you, application code doesn't need to be rewritten. Later on, we'll sort of see how pushing all this multi-region complexity inside the database allows us to do things, uh, do some nifty things in the, in the optimizer layer. Um, and and even, even in our transaction protocol. Um, and, and, and the obvious one sort of here is that we wanna provide low latency data access wherever possible. And when I say low latency data access, what I really mean is region local access. The North Star here is we wanna serve things from inside a particular region where they're being queried from as much as possible. Lastly, we wanna provide a declarative, easy to use high level framework to configure performance and availability goals. For our specific users, we don't want them to, un we don't want them to need to understand the internals of Cockroach and how the system works and how it's implemented to be able to say things like, I want fast access to this table, or I want to survive certain kinds of um, certain kinds of outages, such as region failures and whatnot. And and to sort of like do this, um, we 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 have a few new concepts that Ayush is going to talk about in a bit more detail. Um, so to achieve some of these goals, uh, we decided to introduce uh, three new concepts to Cockroach. Uh, these are regions, survivability goals, and uh, table localities. Regions should uh, should sort of be thought of as uh, as a dependency of the of these other two concepts. And the general idea here is that uh, these concepts make the database aware of the of the multi-region environment that it's running in. Um, regions are now essentially native schema elements that are built into the system. Uh, databases can have a primary region and more regions can be added or removed from the database using uh, DDL statements that, that look like uh, the ones in the, in the slide. Uh, essentially, database regions control the data footprint of the tables in the database, uh, but importantly, they also define or inform a system-provided enum data type that enables a specific table locality pattern that we'll get into in the, in the coming slides. The second concept is survivability goals. Um, each multi-region database, that is a database that has at least one region, 
um, also has uh, an associated survivability goal. Uh, by default, uh, databases are configured to survive zone failures, uh, but uh, any given database can be set to uh, survive either region failures or zone failures. The, the intuition here is that survivability goals necessitate a minimum like quorum diameter. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to survive uh, region failures, you have to ensure that uh, a quorum of, of replicas, a quorum of voting replicas, uh, aren't all co-located in the same region. Um, the idea here is that the user should be able to, uh, with the use of like a simple DDL statement, like what's uh, shown in the slide, uh, be able to tell the system to uh, transparently redistribute data, reconfigure quorum diameters to achieve a given survivability goal. And in order to ground this discussion, um, let's work through like a quick example. In this diagram, we're, we're looking at a database with six regions with US East being the primary region. By default, uh, as I mentioned, databases are configured to survive zone failures. Um, and when that's the case, uh, cockroach, can, uh, cockroach can keep its voting replicas uh, in just the primary region to minimize latency. One thing that we should cover here is that cockroach supports two separate types of replicas, uh, voting and non-voting replicas. Um, and the leader replica, which, which generally corresponds to the RAF leader in this case, um, has to be one of the voting replicas. The distinction here is that voting replicas need to acknowledge rights. Uh, a quorum of voting replicas need to acknowledge rights for them to uh, commit into the RAF log, whereas non-voting replicas um, asynchronously just keep up with the RAF log. Uh, that means that they're not in the, in the hot path of, of a right. Uh, which allows us to place these non-voting replicas further away from the from the quorum of voting replicas. Um, now, it's worth also considering what happens when we transition a database from zone survivability to region survivability. The, the main thing that's changed here is that now we need to achieve consensus across regions. We can no longer have our voting replicas, the yellow ones, uh, all be co-located in US East. Um, but given that US East is, is still our uh, primary region, we still pin our leader replica to be in US East. The other thing that's changed here is that uh, we've upped the replication factor of voting replicas from three to five. Uh, this enables two things. One, it allows us to survive two independent machine failures, uh, right? because now we have five voting replicas. Um, in addition to being able to survive one independent region failure. Uh, but importantly, it also allows us to survive the failure of the, of the leader replica in the primary region um, while immediately failing over to another voting replica in the same region. So we, so we take care to ensure that uh, the primary region has two voting replicas so that an, a machine failure in the primary region doesn't mean that the leader is, is uh, failed over to another region that might not be where the data affinity is. Okay, so the, the last concept over here is that of table localities. And uh, table localities is the way for, for operators or application developers to, to sort of say to Cockroach that these tables have, uh, have a particular locality. And, and these come in two types. Um, the, the first one is regional and regional by row tables. So this is for the kind of data that has affinity to a particular region. Regional tables entirely have affinity to one region. So, so a table could have affinity to US East. And regional by row tables have affinity at the level of a row. So every row can have affinity to any of the regions that, that have been added to the database. This is sort of our take on, on partitioning and we'll cover them in a bit more detail going forward. And then the second kinds of, uh, ki kind of table locality that we have here is that of a global table. Global tables provide fast, consistent reads from all regions that have been added to, to the database. This does, however, come at the expense of, uh, of slower writes, but it's, it's good for things like, um, it, it's good for things like, uh, like reference tables, which are, which are rarely going to be going to be updated, but they're read from often um, things like foreign key checks and what have you. Now we talked about these like 
three concepts that we added to the database. And, and with this, the, the database is really aware of the multi-region environment that it's running in. And they sort of conspire together to, uh, to, perform, uh, to, to provide certain um, optimization benefits transparently to the user uh, without, without requiring the user to change any of their application code. And, and, and the two things that we're going to talk about um, in the coming slides is, um, is that of the SQL optimizer. So, the, so Cockroach has a cost-based SQL optimizer that is now aware about regions. And it's also aware about the cost it takes um, to sort of do queries that, that span region boundaries. So essentially, it can do things like forego remote region lookups um, in cases where it's safe to, safe to do so. Uh, it can also do certain things like, um, like optimistically look in, in local regions first when, when that works for, for the kind of query that's being, uh, that's being performed. Um, the second thing here is, um, is like we hinted, global tables. And, and these sort of work on a, uh, on a novel transaction protocol that we're going to cover in depth. Um, and, and global tables are, uh, are really cool. And, and using, this, um, using this transaction protocol, we provide the, the high-level guarantees that we advertise to, to our users of, of, fast, writes, of fast reads, uh, fast consistent reads from all regions of the database. But before we dive underneath the covers um, of how these things um, how these things are implemented in the system, let's sort of round up the example that we started off with, and and let's talk about how how this online store that's doing really well how it works uh, with with some of these multi-region abstractions. So one thing that that that, that right off the bat that this uh, company would do is is they would add the three regions U.S. East, Europe West, and U.S. West to their database. The next thing they might do is, uh, is configure some sort of survivability goal. So say they have a business need to survive a region failure, they, they, they declaratively uh, indicate that using the DDL statement. Then they'd go about um, setting locality patterns on, on their table. So user's table, like we talked about, um, is, is a good, uh, is good candidate for regional by row tables. Um, and one thing that you notice here is, um, is with our solution, the uniqueness uh, property on the email column is, is preserved. And what that means is the application code doesn't need to be aware of which, um, of which partition it needs to talk to. So the query select star from users um, for joeexcite.com, it does not need to change. Um, and then uh, for, for the promo codes table, which didn't have a good affinity for um, a, a good, good um, data affinity um, uh, for, for, for good locality, um, they can mark this table as global. And given new discount codes don't come into play that often, this is, this is a good candidate for, for fast read access. And what Cockroach will do is it's going gonna, it's gonna to place a replica for, for this data in each of the three regions. So now when... Uh, when a US, um, sorry, when a Europe West user tries to query the promo codes table, it'll talk to its local replica instead of instead of paying the round trip latency that it was in in some of the the legacy solutions that we that we talked about. All right, without further ado, let's let's dive into some of the um, the, uh, the the internal details of the system, which uh, hopefully people will find find interesting. And the first one we want to talk about is regional by row tables, uh, which is our take on partitioning. For this, let's look at a table called orders. Users place orders. Users have affinity to particular, particular locations. And um, primarily, users are, are querying their own orders. So it makes sense to place order data close to where the user resides. Um, so yeah, regional by row tables makes, uh, makes sense for such a table. Uh, and, and the first thing that you'll see, and this all happens transparently under the hood, by the way, is when you mark this table as regional by row, a, um, a CRDB underscore region column is added to this table. And this is a hidden column. What that means is um, it, it doesn't expand on select stars, but other than that, it's, it's a regular SQL column that can, be, that can be read by explicitly providing it um, in the query, or it can be written to uh, like normal. Right. Um, 
And then uh, notice that this also comes with a default expression. And then this is how applications don't have to uh, get rewritten. The, the queries just work. And, and, it, and the default expression here is that of the gateway region, the gateway region of the, of the node that's performing the write or the insert in this case. So in general, you can imagine a, a application for, that's deployed in US East, which talks to a cockroach node in US East itself. Uh, and when you perform this insert into the orders table, um, it gets homed in the US East partition by virtue of this, uh, this default gateway region um, built in. We also have this on update clause, uh, which is essentially a rehoming mechanism. And what that means is if, you know, like a user moves from, uh, from US to, uh, to Europe, and then they start accessing this orders table, uh, then the, 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 their role, the role that they're accessing is going to get updated to the new gateway region that they're talking to, uh, so Europe. So essentially the data sort of moves with the user. The last thing to notice here is, um, is that, um, we also have this, um, we, we also partition by this, uh, by this region column. And then Cockroach will automatically place each of these partitions close to, um, or, or like in that region. So essentially the US East partition lives in US East, US West and US West and Europe West and Europe West. Uh, and, and one thing that I forgot to mention is that the, the data type of this CRDB region column is that of the enum that Ayush alluded to earlier. So it takes on values. Um, it takes on values of the regions that have been added to your database. And these are essentially discrete values. Um, and yeah. Okay. The next thing is the uniqueness that is preserved uh, on the email uh, email column that we talked about. Um, now, do, do note that because we are partitioning, uh, we're partitioning by CRDB region and email, which means that it doesn't imply that the email itself is unique. It's just that the tuple of a region comma email is unique. Um, but, but we do want to enforce uniqueness because um, the primary key or the uniqueness uh, constraint doesn't change with, uh, with what, we've, what we've done here. Um, and, and we do this by, uh, by taking advantage of, of the SQL optimizers. The SQL optimizer is aware that uh, this, this insert is going into a regional by row table, and it'll plan certain uh, post-query checks for unique columns to maintain uniqueness. And essentially what they look like is, is like a fan out query, which checks um, all regions that are, that are part of the database to, to see if there are hits for that, uh, for that particular uh, key that's being inserted in this case, email. Um, but, but the system is smart in certain cases to, uh, to not do these fan out queries. Uh, for example, if the, if the uniqueness column has the data type of a UUID and the system has generated this UUID, uh, we're confident that because the probability of collision is so low, we can entirely forego the, the uniqueness checks. Um, so it, it leads to fast, uh, fast speeds at insert time as well. And, and doing this, um, pre preserving uniqueness gets us a bit, right? Uh, like we talked about earlier, it means that um, the partitioning key doesn't have to make its way into the application stack. It also means that the optimizer can take advantage of um, of of the fact that this uh, this thing is unique, um, and and this is done through through a mechanism that we call locality optimized search, and and the intuition here is that it the optimizer optimistically can, can, when looking for a key um, that's unique, the optimizer can optimistically look in its local region first. And only if it doesn't find a hit in that local region, will it do a fan out query to remote regions. So it's sort of aware that, that local region lookups are, are extremely quick um, and, and doing them optimistically can, can pay dividends. If, especially you know, if, you're, if you've configured these things correctly and you expect to always be accessing uh, your own data from your region. Um, this internally is, um, it's implemented using a union all node uh, with, with limit one. And, and so, so essentially if the first scan up there in US East succeeds, uh, that means that the, the, the second arm of the operator is, is never, is never triggered. Um, the, and, and this is, this is cool in, um, in, in other areas as well. So not just when you're doing a simple point select on, um, 
on a unique key. It's also useful for foreign key checks. Uh, it's useful for lookup joins. It's useful for limited scans and what have you. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the is the novel transaction protocol that enables global tables. And, and for that, I'm going to pass it off to, to Ayush. Um, so global tables are, are one of the main innovations of, of this work. Uh, the TLDR is that global tables allow uh, low latency reads from all regions, uh, but at the expense of slower writes. Uh, so they're, they're kind of our take on reference tables, uh, and then they kind of fit into the, the promo codes table that was being talked about. Uh, global tables work by keeping um, all replicas in sync on writes, but they do so without using explicit synchronous replication. Instead, uh, they rely on async replication uh, and a combination of, of uh, clocks to control the visibility of which writes are visible to contending readers. Um, and just to, just to recap, um, in a multi-region database, unless disabled, all tables will have non-voting replicas in each region. Uh, and global tables rely heavily on this. And we'll, we'll talk about why. Uh, a bit of background that, that is important to cover is that Cockroach has supported uh, stale reads for quite some time. Uh, Cockroach supports exact staleness queries as well as bounded staleness queries. Uh, so exact staleness queries are where uh, the client provides an exact stainless bound, whereas uh, bounded stainless queries, uh, the client will provide kind of a maximum stainless limit, uh, and the system will, on a best effort basis, try to satisfy um, that stainless limit by serving it off of the closest replica possible. Uh, the benefits of these like stale reads are, are, are fairly obvious. Uh, they allow you to serve uh, these stale reads locally from, from any, uh, any region that might have a replica and that includes non-voting replicas. Uh, but the trade-off here is that uh, these stale reads need to be acceptable to, uh, to the application for that use case. So not all use case qualify for these. But more importantly, uh, these stale reads cannot be used in read-write transactions. Uh, and the reason for that is because Cockroach provides a serializable isolation, which implies that uh, any transaction has to read and write at the same timestamp. Um, and since we cannot write in the past, uh, stale reads can uh, can only be used in read-only transactions, uh, which ends up being a big limitation. So before we kind of get into what Cockroach does to implement global tables, uh, it's worth it's worth highlighting the the core issue with uh, with sort of the naive like two-phase commit implementation of global tables. Um, so consider a scenario where we have a leader replica and we have a bunch of follower replicas. And um, in, in this like naive protocol, the leader would, uh, would sort of perform a prepare phase to try to commit a write at timestamp 12. Um, and individually, all of the followers would ensure that uh, they haven't served a read that invalidates that write. So if any of these followers have served a read above timestamp 12 for, for that key, um, then, then that, that would invalidate this, right? And then the followers would, would have to reject it. Um, and after this prepare phase is done, the, the leader finally issues um, like a commit, which is the, the commit phase. Um, the thing to note here is that under contention, a, a, given, a, a given reader will have, to, will have to block on, the, on this write at timestamp 12 to actually commit before it can determine which value it needs to read. Uh, so in the worst case, we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of subjecting readers to wait up until the, the round trip time uh, to, be able to, to be able to resolve conflicts. This means that under contention, the latency profile of, of such a global table implementation becomes fairly unpredictable. And for us, that, that kind of, uh, that becomes uh, kind of a breaking a problem with, with this approach. Now, we'll, we'll talk about what Cockroach does to, to implement uh, global tables. The, the thing to note here is that because Cockroach um, is an MVCC system, uh, reads operate over sort of a, a MVCC read snapshot. It's, it's sort of a logical MVCC read snapshot. Systems like Cockroach and, um, and like Spanner have a way for leader replicas to be able to declare that 
uh, the MVC history below a given timestamp is immutable. Um, Cockroach calls it closing a timestamp. So in this example, um, the leader replica is trying to close uh, present time plus a delta into the future, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the idea is that the leader replicas can, um, can periodically close um, MECC history below a given timestamp and broadcast these updates to follower replicas. As the follower replicas uh, learn about these, these closed timestamp updates, they know for a fact that uh, they can serve reads that are below these closed timestamps because the leader has guaranteed that the MECC history below a given uh, closed timestamp is immutable. Uh, and this is actually how stale reads work. So generally, uh, a leader replica, and, uh, and, and this kind of configured by default, a leader replica will close out MECC history uh, by default three seconds in the past. And uh, this allows all follower replicas, including non-voting replicas, to be able to serve stale reads for um, reads that are older than present time minus three seconds. Um, we, we, we extended, in order to implement global tables, we extended this idea um, to instead start closing, uh, closing timestamps, a set delta into the future. This delta um, is, is dynamic based on the round trip, based on like the round trip time between the leader and the furthest follower, uh, plus a clock offset. A bit of an aside here is that uh, cockroach clusters will, uh, will have a configured clock offset that the operator configures. Uh, and, and we'll kind of get into that as well in a, in a bit. The idea is that um, if the leader closes a timestamp, um, delta milliseconds or delta timestamps into the future, um, if a present time read arrives on any of these follower replicas, it should see that the MECC history as of, as of that timestamp has already been closed or has already been declared immutable. And this is this precisely, precisely the reason why this delta uh, is defined as half of the round trip time uh, plus the clock offset. The idea is that half of the round trip time is what it would take for each of these uh, closed timestamp updates to be broadcast from the leader to the furthest follower replica. And um, since a, a read that arrives on one of these follower replicas sees that the MECC history has already been declared immutable, the follower replica doesn't need to talk to the leader to, to be able to serve this present time read. Um, the, the, the reason we, we need to close, um, we need to have the clock offset factor in there is because um, any of these follower replicas can be, uh, can be offset from the leader replica by up to this configured uh, clock offset. So, you know, we're, we're closing things in the future, um, so some delta in the future, which, uh, which brings, which brings with, itself, with itself, uh, interesting question, which is how do you, how do you ever write if you're always saying that present time plus something cannot be mutated? And, and the answer to this is, um, we actually write in the future. So, um, Cockroach will schedule its writes above this um, or, or like at, at this now plus delta timestamp. The natural extension to this is how do we maintain any form of consistency um, with, with this whole scheme of writing into the future? And, and for that, let's talk about um, what, what consistency means in terms of uh, linearizability, single key linearizability that Cockroach uh, aims to offer. And, and two things worth focusing on are, are read your own writes and monotonic reads. Read your own writes essentially means that if a, if a client has performed a write and right after it's performed that write, it goes on to read the same key, it should be able to see that key. It shouldn't see any previous value. Um, and the, the other thing is monotonic reads, which is that if a client performs a monotonic read, uh, oh, sorry, if a client performs a read and then it goes and performs another read, it should either see that same value or it should see something that's newer. And, and to sort of like enforce both of these things, we, 
Um, we, we do them separately. Uh, for video on own rights, we we take advantage of of the commit wait protocol. Um, I think Spanner also offers uh, also uses uh, the commit wait protocol, um, and and we actually talk about in our Sigma 2020 paper why Cockroach does not need commit wait protocols for um, for for its um, for regular tables, but for but just for global tables, we we take advantage of commit wait. And the idea here is that when a writer to a global table is performing a write, after committing the write and before acknowledging that write back to the client, it's going to wait out the, the, the delta that we talked about, the, the round trip time plus the, the clock offset in the system. Now for monotonic reads, we actually make use of an already pre-existing concept in, in Cockroach, and that's that of the uncertainty interval. Um, as, as, as in any distributed system, clocks aren't in sync. And, and for Cockroach, uncertainty interval is essentially for a transaction that finds something in its, that, that, finds, that finds a write in its timestamp plus um, the clock offset. It can make no claims on what came first. Did the, did the read come first or did that write come first? Should it see it or should it not? Um, and whenever a reader to a global table sees a write in its uncertainty interval, it actually waits out the uncertainty interval before acknowledging to the client. Let's actually look at, look at this slide. Um, there, there's a lot going on, but it kind of hammers home the last point there, the, the point about waiting for the uncertainty interval. And this sort of based on the assumption that in, in a multi-region setting where you're using global tables, a majority of um, a majority of the of the time is is going to be spent in round trip communication from from the leader to the furthest follower, um, and and that's what's impacting the majority of the commit wait time, right? L like we talked about earlier, the commit uh, the commit wait time is um, is the sum of um, it's the sum of the latency from the leader to the furthest follower plus the maximum clock offset. And our claim is that the maximum clock offset is 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 like a small fraction of this time, uh, which which is something we believe in, given that you know in cloud environments and and uh, in cloud environments, this is something we can we can sort of drive down. Um, so essentially, what that means is whenever the read, uh, so, so if there's a write um, that that takes the commit wait amount of time to become visible, um, if a read comes in in the early part or the or not sure if people can see my cursor, but in the in the first part of this phase um, that we see on R four, it can simply return because you know it the the write has not is not made visible yet. The only time that the reader may have to block is when it comes at a timestamp within this uncertainty interval. Uh, so the reader doesn't know whether it should see that right or not. And in that case, it'll it'll wait out the uncertainty interval before returning the result to the client. Um, es essentially, what that means is, unlike the 2PC scenario where, where readers could block for network, could, could block for a factor that's dominated by, by network latency, in our transaction model here, we are at worst waiting for uncertainty interval amount of time. Uh, we actually have a few experiments in the paper itself um, that talk about how the tail latencies on global tables vary as you change the, the values of this uh, max clock offset that's configured on your cluster. And, um, and, and, and if you look at some of the graphs in the paper itself, it's, it's pretty evident that making claims about the tail latency is... Um, is much easier in, in this global tables mechanism than, than in something that, that Cockroach had, had before. Um, so to, to kind of wrap this up, um, the, the one thing that, that we should just talk about is, uh, is the consequences of, uh, of clocks Q exceeding the max offset bounds that, that I mentioned that are configured per cluster. Uh, so for example, by default, Cockroach clusters are configured to have uh, 250 milliseconds or, or 500 milliseconds of, of clock offset between uh, between nodes. The thing to note here is that um, if that is violated, the, the the loss here is that we might be we might run into kind of causal reverse situations 
which is a violation of cockroaches' single key linearizability model. Uh, but more importantly, um, it, it isn't a violation of, uh, of our isolation guarantees. Uh, the, the system is still uh, providing serializable isolation. Um, the thing to note here is that this is not a concern that is new to global tables. Um, this, this issue with uh, causal reverse uh, is also possible um, with, with, with just like regular transactions on a, on a non-global table. Um, say, for example, if um, a reader encounters a write that isn't in its uncertainty window, uh, but actually causally happened before the reader, um, like that, that, that is still possible uh, for, for you know, non-global tables. Um, and, and, and this is something that uh, we, we kind of, I guess, monitor in our, in our cloud fleet. Um, and uh, that's why we have to be pessimistic with the, with the configured uh, clock offset bounds. So that was it for our presentation. Um, we're happy to take questions now. You can also email us um, after the fact if, uh, if, there's, uh, if there's things that, that need to be discussed. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.